Hey everyone, welcome back to another devlog for Dauphin. This one's kicking off at 6am on Tuesday morning, unfortunately almost two weeks after the last video. I've continued work on Dauphin in the Godot engine since the last episode, but just at a much slower pace. I've had a significant spike in my workload for my job, and unsurprisingly, it's pretty hard to want to sit down and make a game after my brain is fried from 10 hours of coding at work. Anyway, things seem to be coming back under control and I'm feeling rested and ready to get back on the horse. Let's kick things off by looking at the changes I've made since the last video. So I've made quite a few small tweaks and improvements in the past few weeks, and I can think of probably four things that are worth mentioning here. The first, based on a very clear piece of feedback from the last video, was to change the fireball attack to some kind of water attack. I didn't spend much time on this, really just changed the color because I think it's going to end up changing in the future, but I did make that change for now. You'll also notice that I implemented damage numbers above the crap, so when we hit them, you can see that there is a little damage indicator based on how much damage the attack did. You'll also notice that that number is not always the same, sometimes it's 3 or 4, and sometimes we can get a critical hit which shows up in yellow, which is pretty cool. This was another clear piece of feedback. Attacks should not just do always the same amount of damage, but instead have a damage range. I thought this was important and I very much agreed with it, so we have it now. Finally, I've made a small improvement to the inventory system past where I had it before in Unity. You can see in my inventory I have one little sand crab shell fragment here with a little one to indicate that that's the current stack size, and don't worry, I'm going to make that look better in the future. Because the loot inventory data associated with these shell fragments indicates that they can have a max stack size of greater than one, that means that I can now go pick all these up and instead of occupying separate slots in the inventory, they all stack in the first slot that has an item of that same type that has not reached the maximum stack size, so it's nice to see that working. The next question now is where do we go from here? If you look at my Trello board, you can see that we're still in milestone 0.4 for the inventory. There's one task left, which is dragging and dropping. This means dragging inventory items between slots and dragging them outside the inventory to drop the item back on the ground. This will be really cool functionality, but I feel like this is gonna be a really big pain in the butt. So if it is, we might scope it out for later, but I'm gonna give it the old college try. The next milestone on the roadmap is island exploration. This is something we kind of tackled in Unity, but I want to seriously expand upon it here in the new project. What this means is I need to introduce scene transitions again, which I have not ported over from the previous project, and I want to explore some options for procedural generation of islands, since I want to be able to explore tons of different islands in the game, have you sail between islands, find different enemies, find different treasure. So I just wanna start learning about this because I really know nothing about it and that's gonna be a lot of fun. But first, we gotta deal with the inventory. It's going on 6.30 now. I've probably got about 45 minutes before I take a break and do a workout with Kate. So I've got a fresh cup of coffee, time to buckle down and see if I can drag around some of these inventory items. Hey everyone, coming back with an update this evening. After work, after dinner, it's actually going on at eight o'clock now. But the good news is with my time spent on the inventory system this morning and this evening, I have made a ton of progress. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. So the first of the two tasks that I had on my Trello board for finishing up the inventory was being able to move items around inside the inventory. So let's go ahead and pick up some of these shells, move away from the crab, and when we open up the inventory, you can see I have four shells in the first slot because they're stackable. Now I can click on one of these and it will snap to the mouse and it will actually follow the mouse anywhere around the screen. If I position the mouse over any one of these other slots in this particular inventory and I click, it will snap into that inventory slot. This uh, took a lot of work. I will probably make a tutorial about it at some point if you're interested, but it's actually working pretty well for now. So I'm quite happy about that. The next piece of functionality I wanted was for the player to be able to quickly and easily clear their inventory of items that they no longer want. To do this, we can select the item just as we did before, but instead of dropping it into another slot, we can just drop it outside of the inventory. You'll see when that happens, the item drops just as it normally would from an enemy and slides a little bit away from the player. Now there's actually quite a bit more going on here. If I just dropped this normally, the player would pick it right back up, so right now it has a timer. After that timer expires and the loot re-enters the player's loot detection circle, he will pick it back up again. 
In addition to this, we have to consider the case where the player has a stack of items. So I'll go ahead and pick up four of these guys. And you'll see now that when I pick this up, I have a stack of four of these shells. When I drop these, as you'd expect, four get dropped in a circle around the player. I think this actually looks really cool and I'm very happy with how this turned out. Just as before, the player's not gonna automatically pick these up. I need to go ahead and leave and re-enter to show that I want to actually be intentional about picking those items up again. Getting all that input detection to play nicely actually took quite a bit of trial and error, but I think it turned out great, and I now have a very strong understanding of how input is parsed by the scene hierarchy in Godot, so I know that's gonna help me out in the future. Anyway, I think that'll do it for tonight. It is past eight o'clock now, and I think I'm just gonna unwind and play video games with some buddies. We will definitely catch up tomorrow morning. Good morning, everyone. It is 6.30 on a beautiful Wednesday morning here today. Just spend some time out on the porch taking in some fresh air while my coffee was brewing, but now I've got a fresh cup and I'm at my desk ready to go. Today marks the starting point for Milestone 0.5 for Dolphin's development, which is a revisitation of island exploration. I'm not going to dive too deep into everything I'll be doing in this milestone quite yet, but as an overview, the whole point of this milestone is to create a procedurally generated cave on the island that we already have and be able to enter that cave and explore it. I'm going to start things off by learning about procedural generation in Godot this morning. And of course I'm going to use that to make the cave, but I'm hoping to also extend that in the future to procedurally generate islands that you'll encounter as you're exploring the ocean. For now, I'm going to dive into some tutorials and I'll let you know in a little bit where I end up. Good morning again and welcome back. It is Thursday now and despite taking the evening off to enjoy some time outside last night, I still managed to make some pretty interesting discoveries around the procedural generation of levels yesterday. So let's take a quick look. Since I've never really done anything like this before, I started out yesterday by doing some research. This quickly led me to a sample project provided by GD Quest. And if you've never heard of GD Quest, they're kind of an educational platform run by a guy named Nathan, but really it's a team effort of folks producing really amazing content around Godot. So I definitely recommend checking them out. And of course, I'll leave a link in the description. This is what this project looks like after you pull the code down and run it locally. You can see I've got the splash window here. And if I go ahead and press space to start it, you'll see that this generates a level by creating a path from the beginning of a new level to the end of that level and then filling in all the space around it. So we'll go ahead and press space so you see what I'm talking about. You can see it walk through the level from the top to the bottom, coming up with a path all the way through. And then after it does that, it fills in all the rest of the space with different rooms. And it does so in a way such that the player can't get stuck trying to navigate towards the exit. Now in this particular case, they've kind of done this framed around a platform, but I didn't see any reason why I couldn't adapt this to my kind of top-down RPG look. So that's what I tried to do yesterday morning. Because the code for this demo project is MIT licensed, I was basically able to start by grabbing the snippets that I wanted and pulling it straight into my project. After I did that, I literally went through this line by line to understand what it was doing and also made some changes to make it reflect my coding style a little bit more. That also aided in helping me understand what was going on here. After I did all that, I created my own procedural island with this new script, and I'll go ahead and show you that now, but it is nowhere near as cool, obviously, as the demo we just saw. What you're looking at here is a procedurally generated square of an island that uses my art, and it's kind of the same thing as you saw before. It's got a path going all the way from the top to the bottom. Now, if I go ahead and run this again, we'll see that it generates something completely different. Uh, still using the same kind of basic layouts for these individual tiles, but again, providing us a way to get from the top to the bottom. Pretty cool. I'm not gonna take too deep of a dive into the code just because it's available on GD Quest's GitHub page, and I definitely recommend you go poke through it there. That said, I do wanna take a look at the two main files that kind of encompass all of this functionality, and it's only 250 lines of code, which is really cool. The first file here is the level generator, which is responsible for laying out the entire level. 
And really you can see how this happens through this generate level function, which is really nicely laid out here to kind of show you everything that happens in this file. When we know we want to generate the level, we update our start position, which is the first place where we'll be placing a chunk of the level. And once we know that, we basically loop through this while statement here to lay out the individual room types and increment the position on the path through the level. Once we've done that and we have a path from top to bottom, we go ahead and place the walls around the level, place the rooms along that path, and then fill the areas outside of the path. You could kind of see this take place sequentially in the demo I showed before. Apart from just knowing how to create the grid for the map, we have to know how to place content in the map that will allow the player to traverse that grid. This information is encapsulated in a scene called Rooms, and that's what we're looking at here, my island room scene. Now, if we go ahead and take a look at the top children here, we'll see that they have kind of funny names. LR, LRD, LRU, and LRUD. What these correspond to are sides of the room that the player can enter and exit. So LR is left, right. And if we go ahead and look at that room, you can see that it's accessible on the left and the right. Similar concept with left, right, down. If we look at that one, it's accessible on all sides but the top. Because I've got my rooms laid out and labeled this way, the level generator engine is able to pick them up and decide how to place them in the grid that it's already created. Of course, the result of this, as you saw, is an unfortunately ugly, but overall completely functional randomly generated map with a path from beginning to end, top to bottom. Now you're probably looking at this and wondering how I'm going to incorporate this into Dauphin. As I mentioned before, I love to have procedurally generated islands and caves that the player can discover, but right now I don't even have a way for the player to transition scenes. That is functionality that I did not bring over from Unity. So I think what I'm going to do in the near term is change gears and create uh, really just a handmade cave for the player to transition to. And to do that, we first need to make a new tile set. Hey everyone, back with a quick update on Friday afternoon after work. It's five o'clock now and I just wanna show you what I didn't get a chance to show you this morning, which was progress that I made on my tile set for the cave scene that I wanna create in the very near future. So if we load up a sprite here, we can see what I was able to crank out this morning. And bear in mind, I'm still very much a novice with pixel art, so constructive criticism is certainly welcome. Nothing too complex here, I've got some tiles for the ground with some little pebbles and some glowing mushrooms which I thought were kind of cool. Uh, my walls are supposed to kind of look like they're covered with ivy and maybe a couple of leaves. And then of course uh, the ceiling or the, the top of the walls which will be obviously an area that the player cannot access. Uh, apart from that, we've got a pretty cool looking exit to the cave with some vines draping over which I'm pretty happy with. And then finally we just have some decorations which probably will not end up being tiles but instead separate scenes that I create. Just the two rocks that I stole from the beach and recolored for the cave. Then I made a pretty cool looking little stalagmite thing, which I think would be a pretty nice decoration for the interior. My initial plan was to use this tile set to build out transitions from the beach to the cave today. But given that it's already Friday afternoon and I want to get this video out tomorrow, I think we'll just have to settle for building the cave scene and worrying about the transitions and procedural generation in the next video. That said, it was a rather long day at work today, very much deserving of a refreshing beverage on the porch. So I'm gonna go do that for now and we will catch up in the morning when I've got the cave scene built out. guys, I am back on Saturday morning at 7 a.m. with the final update of the devlog, and I'm pleased to report I have the basic prototype of my cave scene working. Here's a first look at the entire scene zoomed out, and of course I did not spend very long laying this out by hand, but you get the idea. This is what I ultimately want the procedural code to generate. Not really just some big square with a ton of rooms, but instead something a bit more linear that the player knows they need to work through in order to get the treasure at the end. Inside the cave, you'll definitely notice that my tile set still needs a little bit of work here and there, but overall I think this actually looks really cool. The walls look pretty neat with the ivy, and of course the stalagmites and the rocks add a pretty nice little bit of detail to the ground here. 
as we walk through it. Uh, it's pretty much just these couple of assets repeated, but I think it's kind of a cool atmosphere that it creates. I've also got a canvas modulate, which changes the color of the entire canvas. You'll see the player's skin looks a little bit more purpley, and I've kind of given that effect to the entire cave with that canvas modulate. So I think this actually turned out pretty cool, and I'm excited to see if I can hook this up to the level generator. But as I mentioned before, that is going to be our task for the next devlog. I'm going to stop here for now and actually finish editing this video and get it out to you guys this morning. As always, thanks so much for watching and for your support as we creep toward 100,000 subscribers, which is crazy. Hope you guys enjoyed this video, and of course, I will see you in the next episode. Have a good one and stay safe.